Hey everybody, what's up? Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Kelly Barrett uh, here at Etcetera Live on the Vibe. Super excited about today's show. Uh, we have iconic artist, musician, author, producer, radio host. Uh, Greg Godovitz is here. Greg, how are you doing? Just enjoying, <laughs> just enjoying a good book, Kelly. So, <laughs> do tell, do tell. What's the book, Greg? Uh, it's uh, Up Close and Uncomfortable, much like most people feel when they're with me. <laughs> uh, this is my second book uh, to go along with, uh, well, this one travels with my aunt, which was my first book. I've managed to figure out a way to get two books that are exactly the same size. <laughs> Bookends. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, writing, I'm writing my third book right now, which is called The, uh, the Idiots Trilogy Part 4. So that should be up by Christmas. With the pandemic being what it is, there's a lot of, you know, downtime. Absolutely. And you're making good use of it, obviously. You know, Greg, I have to say, you know, as I'm just listing off your credentials, you know, musician, author, producer, radio host, I think I have to add former badass shit disturber in there, too. I was, because, uh, I was asking you earlier uh, about the Lethbridge Lodge. There's a series of wonderful hotels uh, out in that area. Penticton, I think Kelowna's got one. And we love to, you know, even during our touring days, we never stayed in, if we could help it sort of motel kind of places. We always stayed at really good hotels. And that place, especially because it's got like a garden, it's built around a, like a concourse. Right. And uh, what I remember the most about it was, of course, after we played those concerts in those towns, we'd say, hey, everybody, we're staying at the, the Lethbridge Lodge. Everybody come over to the hotel afterwards, which of course, we <laughs> the management know in. And uh, I usually made my, um, my entrance, uh, they had these gigantic wing chairs that were made out of leather. I would leap from my balcony and bounce off one of these chairs, hopefully you know, <laughs> sitting in it, and then, you know, crash to the ground, you know. And, shenanigans, uh, shenanigans. <laughs> it, seemed like a, it seemed like a good idea at the time. At yeah. the time. <laughs> a little bit of alcohol involved. You yeah. know, Greg, you are living... A crazy, amazing life uh, with 57-year career, no signs of slowing down. Uh, you know, and we're going to get to the books and we're going to talk about Gatto. Um, I have a question for you, though. Is it true that you had actually planned on being an archaeologist until you heard a Beatles album? Yeah, well, I was going to be some sort of an ologist. I mean, it, it was either, you know, an anthropologist or, or an archaeologist or a paleontologist or a geologist or something like that. I spent most of my uh, childhood at the Royal Ontario Museum. I was just like, I just was a sponge for knowledge, you know. Right. So, well, my friends were out playing guns and stuff. I would be with a notepad, you know, eight or nine years old. I'd go to the museum on my own and I'd make notes and draw things. And, and uh, I remember once my dad, my dad worked at the Fort Erie racetrack down by Niagara Falls. And while I was there with him, it was pretty boring for a kid. Uh, you know, horse races were okay, but it was pretty boring. But I was with my dad. But there was an archaeological dig uh, about three blocks from the hotel we were staying in. And uh, there were archaeologists from the University of Buffalo. And they found uh, a native Canadian burial mound. Oh, wow. So because of my you know, little kid knowledge of this stuff, they would have had me dig with them and I was brushing things off and they were showing me how to, you know, you know, and it was, it was great. And so I was really hooked on it. And then of course, when I was 13, my brother brought home the first Beatles album and I remember looking at the cover and uh, it was that Robert Freeman shop where half of them are silhouette and right. little Beatle haircuts. And I remember thinking, they look stupid. <laughs> Until my brother, I'm looking up something here, until my brother uh, dropped the needle in the groove and It Won't Be Long came on and my life changed instantly. That was that, eh? It, it was just, it was like like in a movie where the light bulb goes on and you go, this is, the, that's what I want to do. And it was just, it just, for some reason, well, I mean, it affected everybody that way if you were uh, an age. I have a picture here from uh, Travels. This one, let me see if I can get this up here. I'm using a different computer today, but that that's me in 1964. Look at you, Greg, looking just like a beetle. 
Yeah, it was uh, the absolute perfect. Now, of course, I, I used to get thrown out of the for that. Now I have less hair than any principal I ever had, you know. <laughs> Talk about irony, you know. So, right. I mean, so that's 1964. I'm 13 years old. I've already slept out in front of Maple Leaf Gardens to buy tickets for my grade eight class to the Beatles. I had I hundreds of dollars on me. And I slept, although sleeping wasn't in the question, it was just girls screaming all day in front of the gardens. And uh, when I got to the ticket wicket, I asked for, I think, 160 odd tickets. And the guy said, uh, two per customer, kid. So I, I had the only two Beatle tickets in the school. Wow. I was instantly you were popular. Mr. Popular instantly. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> and I took the only girl in the school that didn't ask me. Oh, yeah. just because, right? Well, she, she was picked on a lot, you know, and I was picked on a lot as a kid, you know, because you know, right. when you're smart and you're surrounded by stupid people, they don't like you. <laughs> right, right, yeah, and good for you. That I think that I think that's a lovely story that you chose the girl. It probably is one of her best memories of her life. Well, we had a good time, uh, and it was really funny because years later, I came home from a Gato gig and I was watching the CBC really late at night, and it was a documentary, a short documentary on the Beatles' first trip to Toronto. And I'm watching it, and I'm watching it, and all of a sudden, getting off the escalator is a 13-year-old me. And I remember it because as I went down to the main level of the gardens to get a drink or something at the show, uh, I got off, and there was this huge clay light, like the CBC would have used to light things back then. Right. And I'm all of a sudden this goofy little kid caught in the headlights. And the, <laughs> the camera guy's going, keep moving, kid, keep moving. And I'm freaked out and you see me spin around and walk away and I went, that's me at 13 at the Beatles concert. I thought, I, I've never found it since, could can't find it. Right, so relatable. You know, you know, Greg, the amount of songs that you've written and the albums, you have written over 300 songs. You've recorded around 150 of them. So I wonder well, if we, we can go back for a bit here, Greg. Uh, just, what's that? I said, you've done your research, thank you. I, I'm, I'm a research kind of girl. Um, and so when you're honing your skill and skills in these different bands and your first band was the Pretty Ones uh, yeah. back in 64, yeah. what was it like back then? What what was the drive that that made you just, you know, launch into it, uh, you know, aside from the Beatles you know, influence? Um, because it's a hard, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard road to go. Uh, give me one second because I've got something I've never shown before. I want to show you and your people. Oh, goody. <laughs> While Greg's grabbing that, everybody, I just want to remind you all that next week, <laughs> Nick Gilder will be here. Oh, uh, I love so you. Tune in for that. And here's Greg. You must say hello to Nick. I was given this. Uh, this is the Pretty Ones business card from 1964. Wow. With, it says Beat Group on it. Can you read that? And then it's got my mom and dad's number, and it's got Ed Pilling's phone number there. But this was like a gift. Actual so, physical phone number? Yes, my mom's 755-4013. No one ever got that number. It's the only number I know by heart. I don't even know my own number. And then <laughs> Ed and Brian's uh, number from over around where they live. So I, I met I met Brian Pilling in grade nine. Um, and uh, he was a greaser when I met him. I, I already had that Beetle haircut, which I've already shown you. Uh, but they had a, like a, I think they called it twerp day or something where anybody in grade 10 and up could pick on you if you're, you know, new to the school. Right, right. And then Brian showed up with his hair washed out in a beetle haircut. He looked like John Lennon, you know. And then we spent weeks and we're not going to roll eggs down the hallway with our noses. Let's get the hell out of here. So <laughs> we went out and ran across the field pretending we were the Beatles in a hard day's night being chased by the girls and then we collapsed on the ground, you know, instant, <laughs> instant bonding. He the says, drama. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm learning how to play the bass. And he says, I'm learning how to play the guitar. And he says, and my brother Ed's coming back from England soon. He plays the drums. So we started practicing and practicing and practicing. And, you know, every time we went into a, a class, we'd write the pretty ones on the on the board. You know, the teacher would come in and go, God, if it's knock it off, you know. <laughs> and, it. And, uh, Ed came back, and we were in a little greasy spoon restaurant not far from here in Scarborough. We didn't notice that we weren't getting served. I mean, I was only 13. Brian was, I think, 14 or 15. 
And Ed comes in, he's like six foot four. He's got really long, blonde Brian Jones beetle haircut. The reason he was late is because the bus drivers wouldn't pick him up. Because of his hair. Yeah. And we, we weren't getting served because of our beetle haircuts. So Ed calls the woman over and she, he says, uh, we'd like menus. And she goes, we don't serve your kind in here. <laughs> and Ed says, well, that's good because I don't want to eat my kind. I want a hamburger and I want one now. And they, right. called, they basically called the cops and we had to leave. I mean, it was, it was actually, it's hard for people to understand what it was like just to have that little bit of fuzz on your head that, I mean, I used to hide in the corridors at high school so that I wouldn't get caught by the vice principal or the gym teachers, especially, because they just throw you up against a locker and go, what the hell are you supposed to be? You know, like, it, it was weird back then. And, and you know what? Look at you now. And I bet all those people just feel like idiots. Well, <laughs> Living what was the best revenge, right? <laughs> they probably all, all have more hair than I've got now, so I, which, the last lap is theirs, you know. <laughs> they probably it, all have auto albums too. <laughs> well, it, it's funny because I, I did have a, a my music teacher at the time uh, kicked me out of class for having long hair, and after the first day, he said, "I want you to stay afterwards," and uh, he said, "Don't come back to my class until you get that ridiculous hair." And I said, well, my mom, he says, I don't care what your mom says. She's not in this class. I said, well, Beethoven had long hair. Right? <laughs> and he said, I don't want you coming back anyway because you've got a big mouth. So that was the end of my formal training as a musician. We went back after the third Gato album where, you know, we had that, um, I think I have a copy of it right here for some reason. Yes, who's prepared? Uh, on, on the Act of Gato album, um, there's an overture that I wrote of classical music, uh, which we called Anna Canna Panica. And he came up to me when we went back, you know, I came back to play my high school and it was packed and everything. And he came up to me and he had all three of the albums and he'd been telling the kids that he taught me music. I bet. After he now, now you that. And, you know, <laughs> so I, I just went, this is, I mean, this is just wrong, you know. Right. But crazy good story though, you know, you know the way things were back then, and and uh, you know, nineteen and so in nineteen seventy four, I, I, I want to just jump back a little bit because um, with I want to like talk about flood for a little bit because that's kind of your first foray foray into recording your music, was it not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the pretty ones, I I, I was fifteen, a couple years, and we did some strange stuff. My mother was a co-check girl at the Friars Tavern. So my Saturday afternoons were spent watching the guys who became the band, Leave On and the Hawks. I would go on Saturday afternoons and watch them. Nice. And, uh, David Clayton Thomas would be hanging around. Ronnie Hawkins would be there. So at 13, that was like my first introduction to live music and stuff. And the pretty ones, actually, my mom convinced Mr. Josie, the manager, she goes, you know, Mike Gregory's got a good little group of kids, but they can sing. And we went down and we played in the afternoon, sitting in with uh, Levon and the Hawks, Levon Elms band, right? Robbie Robertson and all those guys. And wow. uh, a couple of disc jockeys from Chum AM, which was the big deal at the time, saw us and took us up to Club 888 that night where there was a thousand people to see an RFB band. And I'm 13 years old and we're playing in front of these people, you know? And oh, then we got, a, we got a gig two doors down from the Friars at a place called the Rocket of go, go And it was an after hours club. So it didn't even open until one o'clock. And my mother would give me a dollar. I'd see her at the Friars and she'd be going home. And I would be, be going with Brian and Ed and our original guitar player. And we would play till three o'clock in the morning when I was 13 years old. <laughs> and there was prostitutes in there and like all <laughs> muck addicts and rounders. I mean, it was, it was handy stuff for little kids, you know? So at okay. 15, Brian and Ed decided to go back to England. And I remember seeing them off at Union Station crying because my parents were pretty good about letting me do things, but they weren't about to let a 15-year-old go to England by himself. Right, right. So Ed and Brian went. They ended up in Cat Stevens' band. Nice. Uh, and they went, they played the Paris Olympia, and they did the uh, the Saville Theater that Brian Epstein owned. 
uh, played with Jimi Hendrix. Uh, so I, I ended up going into a blues band at that point. And then I went into a psychedelic band with Eddie Schwartz, the guy that wrote Hit Me With Your Best Shot. I mean, the one thing about, you know, whoever's controlling my life, and I believe there is somebody sitting here or over here on my shoulder. 100%. Uh, I always played with great musicians, even when we were kids, you know. I was really lucky like that. And then Brian, think, they came back. I don't know if it's all luck, Greg, or it's just that I think good musicians are drawn to other like-minded, talented musicians. Yeah, so but, I think a little bit is yeah. that is luck, and a little bit is speaks to your own talent. Well, you, you know, know, for sure. I picked up a book a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was a, a history of Rush book. There's a trilogy of the Rush in the 70s. And I just randomly opened up the book, and all of a sudden, Alex Lifeson's talking about me. And I just opened up to page 158, and I went, what? And I'd forgotten completely that Ray Daniels, that managed Rush right up to the end, he lived on a mattress in the basement of our band house on the Lodale Avenue and actually came to England with Brian and Ed and I once. I, I remember asked him, why did you come to England with us? You know, I ended up sleeping with Rush's manager in a single bed in Aunt Hilda's <laughs> attic in Birmingham. But I'd forgotten about that. But, you, you know, Getty and Alex used to come over to the house for jam sessions. And <clears throat> it was just that kind of a scene, you know. But I think the, the thing about it was is we were deadly serious about what we were doing. We were going right. to be rock and roll stars no matter what right uh, and that's what it takes. that yeah. really is what it takes greg it's just that this is because i don't think being a musician is what you do it's who you are and it's it's just something that has to come out and i think you need that you know more so today than back then but you really do need that just unbridled drive and not just that 100 percent you know hyper focus on it to, to have the success that you've had that you well, have had and are still continuing to have we were prepared to starve there's no doubt about it right mean, when I lived in Yorkville uh, Village uh, during the hippie days, uh, I, I mean, you know, I'd walk down Yorkville Avenue and Joni Mitchell would be playing at the Riverboat and Neil Young would be playing at the Minor Bird with Rick James and the Poppers that became Lighthouse would be over at the El Patio and you'd see Bruce Coburn walking around and Marie McLaughlin. I mean, it was, it, it's like whatever direction I was being led in, even at 16, living on my own down in Yorkville, I would have a guitar. I would do gigs for a little bit of money on the weekend and then pawn my guitar on Monday, buy enough pot to sell to the tourists, so to speak. Right. Get my guitar out of hawk. Oh, and peanut butter and bologna and, and craft dinner. That's, that's what oh, yeah. we lived on. Right? You, ben. <laughs> we were the band. You know that. And then Friday, I would, you know, sell enough pot to get my guitar out of hawk and then do the same thing the next week, right? But it, it was like a real learning curve, you know, like surrounded by all these incredible artists. And, and when you heard, when we couldn't afford to go to the riverboat, but we could sit outside and listen to Joni Mitchell or right. Junior Wells or Buddy Guy or uh, Jose Feliciano, whoever was playing there, we, we couldn't afford the three bucks to get in. But you could tell that you were you were hearing greatness. You could just tell that these people were going to make it. One hundred percent. You know, Greg, I love hearing you talk about that era because I just, you know, I just think it was such a great time for not only the music in general but the Canadian music industry. You know, in the from the seventies to the nineties, you know, bands were born out of Canada that. I don't know if it'll ever be replicated. The longevity that bands and artists like yourself enjoy today. I, I hope that's not the end of it, but I kind of feel like, you know, the bands that came from those certain eras, they're the ones that people still want to hear today or the ones that are still out there doing stuff. It was just this explosion in Canada of incredible artists that are still around today and still much loved. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great time. Yeah, it, it was amazing. And, and getting to know these people, you know, it's one thing to like be able to hear them, but, you know, all of a sudden your friends, like, you know, I ended, I ended up in, as band leader for Ronnie Hawkins for two years, 40 years later after I met him, you know? Right. And then, you know, all of a sudden Gordon Lightfoot, you know, him and, and Leona Boyd, and I took her to the opera one night. I mean, and I shake my head and go, like, how did this all happen? You know, like we're, I'm still, I mean, I'm still a fan. Gowan and I were talking about 
you know, I, I've met Paul. He almost met Paul. He recorded at Ringo's place. Steve Lukather introduced me to Ringo. We were just bouncing these stories off of each other. And I'm thinking to myself, how did it happen that, you know, I'm inspired by the Beatles and I end up meeting two of them in, in really nice circumstances and George Martin and, you know, Cynthia Lennon and I've got Jeff Emmerich that recorded the music from Abbey Road on my radio show. And I, I shake my head and go, this is an incredible, which is why I write all these stories down because I think they're worth telling to people. Oh, and people want to hear like, oh, you have so much to draw from for your books, Greg. And, and it's, so it's true. You just mentioned you met two Beatles, three Rolling Stones, two Kinks and one Virgin Billionaire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When after I joined Flood, I, I saw them at a high school just up the street on Midland Avenue from where we live now, and uh, I went, "Oh, I got to get in this band." I mean, you know, first of all, Brian was my best friend. They were back from England. Their accents were really cool again, you know. Right. And uh, I saw them, and they were they were phenomenal. Ed was no longer playing the drums now. Uh, the great Jorn Anderson, I still call him John. Uh, it was the drummer. It was an incredible drummer. So he ended up working with Bernie McLaughlin and, and all sorts of people recording with everybody. And uh, so I basically said, you got to get rid of the guy you got and get me in the band. And then they hadn't recorded then. And then the next thing I know, we're flying to San Francisco and we're at Pacific Studios in San Mateo recording an album with uh, Fred Cotero, who did all the Santana records and Mallow nice. and all these San Francisco bands was engineering. And uh, one of the poppers, Adam Mitchell, was producing, uh, which that's another story. <laughs> I don't want to talk about him. But, sure. <laughs> but you know, all of a sudden, our records were on the radio. You know, Turn right. 21 came up, and uh, and then we recorded Cousin Mary. And then one day, because I, I always bought the English trade magazines, I saw this full page ad for a new kind of studio where you could live in it while you recorded. It was called The Manor. And this was the brainchild of Richard Branson. So all of a sudden, a month later, I showed it to Brian and Ed and our manager, Skinny. And a month later, we are the first band from offshore moving into The Manor. And Mike Oldfield is there recording Tubular Bells. Nice. Uh, Graham Bond, that had the Graham Bond organization, which included... Uh, Jack Bruce Jack. and Ginger, Ginger Baker, who was there. And we spent three weeks, I think it was, recording, except we spent most of our time in the Jolly Roger pub getting juiced. <laughs> getting inspired. Yeah, it's, it's, where I, it's where I developed my, my future passion for riding around on the top of fast-moving vehicles. <laughs> we, had, we had a Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud, and we had a Bentley at our disposal. And after a trip to the pub, I would get on top on the roof and they would try and shake me off while they were driving down the down the country lanes in Oxfordshire, you know. See, badass badass shit to stir. I knew it. And I and once you know a bit about Greg's books, you'll get that feeling too. So Greg, in 1974, uh, you formed Gotta with drummer Marty Moran. Uh, actually you would later be replaced by Doug Inglis and guitarist Gino Scarpelli. And you guys go on to release 11 albums, so many great tunes, and just launch this amazing career. What was that experience like? Well, I left Flood because I was writing, already writing the Gatto songs. Uh, right. I did Cock On, which came out of the second Gatto album, who cares? And <laughs> I'd written Chantel in Flood, which was on the third Gatto album. And uh, they wouldn't do them. And my mother, Flood was a real family-based band, you know, English right. and all. And so our, our parents would come to the parties with the band, and my mother was sitting chatting with Brian, and she said, you know, Brian, my Greg is writing some really good songs. And he says, well, I hope you'll forgive me, Mrs. Godovitz, but Flood is my group, and I write the songs. And well, now. I quit. As soon as she, she told me, I said, well, obviously they're never going to do my songs. Right. I love them and I'm going to miss them, but I'm going to put a band together where I'm that guy. Absolutely. And that's what I did. And I ended up writing 300 songs. You know, so. that's a, you know and, um, and sweet thing. I mean, that that's the soundtrack to people's youth and people <laughs> still love that song. And uh, what, is, what is one of the favorite songs you've ever written, Greg, that you love? 
Well, that's one of them, except, you know, of course, for the dubious uh, subject matter. Well. Um, you know, I mean, it, it was written you know, it, in a different time. It was written at a different time, but still, I, mean, I didn't expect to be singing it at 70, you know. Uh, People weren't so touchy back then. No, they weren't. And it was all, you know, sure, I'll go along with that, but uh, not so much anymore. Right. Uh, but, I mean, I, mean, I mean, as far as a riff goes, the record company wouldn't release it because of the subject material in it. You know, a young girl, sweet 16, you know. Right. Uh, so they just said no. But that should have been a hit record. I mean, it's probably our, our most played, for some bizarre reason, on FM stations and that, because the riff is so strong. You know, I mean, it's just, it's like satisfaction or something. And, uh, but you know, when I think about, like Under My Hat off the first album, uh, which my friend Eddie Kramer that did all the Jimi Hendrix records just remixed the first album from scratch. Oh, nice. And it sounds phenomenal. If if anybody goes to my uh, my YouTube channel, uh, Greg Godowitz or Rock Talk, the mix of Under My Hat by Eddie Kramer is up there. Uh, I'd, I'd suggest they wear headphones because Eddie was always known for those panning things that he would so the drums right. are going through your head and flying <laughs> over there, you know. And uh, I got I got to eventually put that out as like a one eighty gram vinyl that's got to come out again. Absolutely. So, Greg, where were you? The you know, so when when God was getting huge and you're touring states and you're touring Canada, where what was it like the first time you heard Sweet Thing on the radio? Was it was there that moment of slight surrealness where where you're like, holy crap, this is big. This is going to be big. Well, there's a funny story about that actually. Uh, when the first album came out, the only game in town at the time was Chum FM, and they flatly they said this album sounds like. Crap. And they were right, it did, because I, I mixed it and I didn't know what I was doing. And it did sound, Under My Hat sounded good, but the rest of the songs were just like, there was no, the bass player producing, I didn't, there was no bottom end on the album, you know? Right. Uh, so, of course, what do I do when I find out you're not going to play my music after, you know, playing eight flood hits for 10 years? Uh, I get a billboard made up, like a sandwich board that says, uh, London, Los Angeles, and New York were all cities where legends were created, not deflated. Chum FM is unfair to local, you know. And I paraded up and down in front of their station like that. I love it. <laughs> they laughed at me. They said, well, look, this is <laughs> do it. But then it made the news. Nice. And I won. I started playing the music. That is, that's a great story. That's a great story. And I mean, you, I mean, you could have burnt their station down, but you know, you chose to peacefully protest and in the end you were victorious. I love it. Nobody, <laughs> would, nobody would sell me matches back in those days. So I had to, <laughs> I had to, I had to do the, uh, the other thing. But I wish I still had that bloody sign because it was a real part of, of who I became as that so-called bad boy of Canadian rock. I mean, that's that sort of set the the ball rolling for going in that direction because I I don't think you can ever find and I, I don't like the word fans but I don't think you, you can ever find a supporter of of God or our, my music that can ever say anything bad because I treated them with total deference you know I loved if they couldn't afford to get into a concert I'd say here's some tickets come on in oh. I love the fans but people in the record companies and stuff the people that called the shots. They don't like that. Not so much. <laughs> no. You know, I mean, I wrote a song called Sign on the Line on the Act of God album, uh, which was originally a letter that I sent to the president of Polydor. And it was uh, it was about, you know, uh, you know, sign on the line. It's in your best interest. Believe me, your lawyers have checked it. Our lawyers accepted their views. The ink is long dried and the documents have neatly been filed. It's a standard procedure in case a court battle ensues. And I sent these lyrics to, uh, I think the last one that broke the camel's back was, uh, you can't deal with record execute jives instead of executives. And I, I wrote, Dear Tim, who was Tim Harold, the president of Polygraph, and mailed it to him. And they dropped us from the label the next week. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> it was a real Sex Pistols moment, you know? Good for you. <laughs> So you know, speaking of speaking of uh, shenanigans and and I love that spirit. I love that 
that take on the world spirit that you have and that you would stand up, you know, to the, to the music station and, and your first book travels with my amp, which I understand is it's, I, I would say it's raunchier um, than, than up close and uncomfortable. Uh, yes. So you wrote that in 2011 and it just was, it was a huge, huge success. People yeah, it, it, did, it, up. it did really well. It did, it did really well. And, and three printings, three printings. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think we're, we're well over 8,000, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in Canada, that's that's, a that's huge. Problem. That's huge. And, and they're still available. Uh, you know, shop Greg Garwitz down below on that crawl. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, when I started to write uh, up close, I wrote another 150 pages of travels with my aunt. And I looked at it and I went, you know, this is just more of the same. You know? The same. Um, I mean, how many blowjob stories can people swallow? You know? <laughs> so anyway, I, sh I shelved it and then started <clears throat> finding stories that I'd written. Apparently, I'd been a writer longer than I realized. I found right. tons of stories about aliens and Elvis and stuff. And shape shifting. Shape shifting aliens, yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, so I thought, these are funny. So I'm going to purposely write a humor book. Travis was funny inadvertently. I was just so out of it when I wrote it that the truth just came out. And of course, the truth is stranger than fiction. <laughs> uh, so I was lucky to write a funny book off, off the, off the get-go. But travel, or the second book up close, I wanted to write a humor book. And that's hard to do. Because you know you think it's funny, you wake up the next morning, uh, and it's not so funny. <laughs> You have to rewrite it. Well, it depends it. on the state you're in your writing, Greg, because I, I heard you quote, um, you were quoting Hem Hemingway once who said, write drunk, edit sober. And you were quoted as saying that you prefer write drunk, edit, editing hungover. So yes. it all depends on the state you're in when you write, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I did extrapolate on Hemingway's great words there, but I think he did it too. Yeah, write drunk and edit sober. No, write drunk and edit hungover. So that's how I did it. So uh, Great. I get it. I get it, Greg. I used to work as a journalist, and um, I wrote drunk all the time, <laughs> uh, mainly because I was a drunk back then. Yeah, um, but, you know, I would, <laughs> I would amaze myself because I would go back and read it, and I would think, I mean, thank God for a spell check, but I would think that was kind of some brilliant writing right there. I don't, I don't know how I came up with that. <laughs> well, you know, if I woke up in the morning and read it and burst out laughing, I go, okay, this is staying like this. Is, yeah. Sometimes the punchline just wasn't there, you know. It wasn't where you, you read the last line and you go, Jesus, that's funny, you know. <laughs> now Cheryl, you know, comes in, Mrs. Claypool, I call her. She, she comes in because I'm in the middle of the night cackling away in the, you know. It's like, for instance, I've developed this problem with my, you'll notice my thumb, hang on, i got to do this right here. See how my thumb is yeah. bent over? I've, I've got I, I can see that. Heret well, that, that's, it stays like that. This one is nice and straight. This one, not so much. It's a good hitchhiking thumb. Well, that's <laughs> in my new book, I, I, I talk about this hideous hereditary disease I've got called Dupuytren's Contractor. I said, you know, I'm having trouble playing these days. I said, but the worst part of it is I can't hitchhike anymore because they don't know which direction I want to go in. <laughs> And, and Don't my, pick that boy up. He's nuts. <laughs> but, but, yeah, and, and Mrs. Claypool says to me, she goes, she says, you should be devastated by this, but how can you find humor? And I said, because that's funny. You know, I mean, that's right. And if I write humor it down, comes, humor comes from sometimes the most unlikeliest situations. Yeah. Well, for instance, I, I figured out that I, I subscribe to that. Fifty is the new thirty. Absolutely. Uh, Sixty is the new forty. But as soon as I turned 70, I realized that 70 is the new 90. <laughs> you know, I will say this, Greg. I love that you continue to challenge yourself and seek out new adventures and projects. And, you know, Christopher Ward and I were talking about this last week, and it, it's so many people tend to sort of pigeonhole themselves. Uh, you know, we get to be, some of us get to be, you know, 40 or 50, and we think it's time for a cardigan and, and a gardening session. And... It, nothing could be further from the two because of what you just said, you know, 70 is the new 50 and 40 is the new 30. And it's and I love your attitude. And I think it's inspiring for others to see it goes until it goes there. It's linear. There's no 
you know, it's beginning and then the middle it ends and the rest is just like waiting for the days to come. It does not have to be that way. And you're such a great example of that. Well, it, it, thank you. Uh, it, it's funny because like people say, have you ever think about retiring? I said, I'm just getting started. Yeah. You know? I mean, I've, I've got so many plans, you know, I, I've got to finish this third book. I, I, I've got a children's novel I started writing 30 years ago nice. for my daughter and that I found in my computer and I went, this is, I mean, I'm not going to compare my writing to Tolkien by any stretch, but it's got <laughs> the same sort of magical forest kind of vibe to it, like you would read in one of those books. And I thought, I, I'm going to finish writing this, uh, you know. She's a grown woman now. But still, and maybe she has kids that, you know. Yeah. Her, her boyfriend works for Drake. He, he writes songs with Drake. Nice. So I said, hey, do you think I could get old Drake on my show? She goes, no. <laughs> Connections. <laughs> hey, I'm, you know, I'm at Paul McCartney, man. He's only Drake. You know? <laughs> Great. Yeah, you got to work on that. You got to work. Drake would be a cool I'd love to have Drake on there. I mean, can you imagine interviewing him? would be cool. That'd be great. <laughs> It'd be a big score. He, <laughs> he travels in rarefied air. I mean, he is the biggest star on this planet. So yeah, he I is. can understand yeah. him saying no. <laughs> <laughs> he just got to call up and go, don't you know who I am, Drake? <laughs> well, I mean, he's a Toronto guy. He has to know. And See? Not only that, but his uh, chief engineer was at my daughter's place. They're good friends. And uh, I have a, a line of uh, In God We Trust hot sauce that's available. It's sold out right now. But cool. The guys, they were eating chicken wings, and he said to my daughter, he goes, uh, have you got any hot sauce around? And she goes, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And he gives this chief engineer that records all of his stuff, and he looks at the label, and he goes, in God we trust, he says, what are you doing with this? And she goes, well, that's my dad. And he goes, Greg Garnabitz is your father? He goes, well, aren't we Miss Humble Little Rock Royalty? <laughs> what a great compliment. <laughs> I keep saying to Jasmine, you know, when Hush is around her boyfriend, play a few of my songs and maybe he'll, you know, slip one to Drake for a track. Yeah, play Sweet Thing or, oh, play Oh Carol. I love that song. I, I love that song. I thought it was so campy and cheeky. And it, the the kiss my whip thing, it became a thing in our band. Uh, it, you know, kind of a, like a little catchphrase. It, you know, when you're kind of telling someone off, it'd be like, kiss my, you know, Carol, kiss my whip. Uh -huh. and, uh, and it was a thing. Great question for you. If, if you could go back in time, what would you tell your 18-year-old self? What advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Keep your bloody mouth shut. <laughs> Listen for a change. Yeah, right. That, that's actually really good advice. Listen and learn. Yeah. I mean, I learned anyway, but I learned the hard way. You know, I mean, I am the guy that, you know, after Morris Gibb from the Bee Gees was Jesus. freaking over my album, uh, you know, and then something went wrong with the tape. And he was saying, well, you know, I want you to stay at my place for a week. I want you to meet Robert Stigwood. And we're going to re-record this stuff with a 70-piece orchestra. I said, you know, I want you to get the hell out of the studio now. <laughs> you know, your machinery just ain't my master. You know, as it turned out, it didn't, and then he wouldn't talk to me. So, I mean, am I still kicking myself with that one? Yeah, except for the fact that Morris is no longer with us, and I'm still sitting right. there. You're still, you're still here pumping out the books, and and uh, you got your podcast, your rock talk. And is there a new band, Greg? We had one uh, based on my solo album, which I just happened to have here, which is also available. I made this album at a studio. It's called Amuse Me. Can't see. There we go. Great uh, title. Great title. Well, I, I met this girl in Calgary. I lived out there for eight years, and I hadn't written a song in 10 years. And um, I wrote 25 songs in one year about her. But oh. they're, not, they're not all love ballads. There's only like a couple of them. Then you get a song called Letting You Go Gets Easier Each Day. Oh, ouch. It's not like that, you know? I Ain't Your Jesus. That was another one, you know? <laughs> so it was. I was all of a sudden the Adele or the, the who's that chick? <laughs> uh, Alanis Morrison. I became the guy version of those two artists, you know, writing the ultimate song about a relationship. Oh, um, bitter and angst. <laughs> When I came back to Toronto a few years back, five years back, I put a band together called The Coalition. 
And we actually started with this album because uh, Paul Dean produced this record. I didn't produce it, I let Paul Dean do it. And he played guitar as well, didn't he? Paul, Love for Boys, Paul oh, Dean. He, he plays played guitar. Paul, Paul Dean. Uh, right. Yes. The guitar solos are incredible on this record. And we had all the Top Gun guys in Calgary. Mike Little from uh, uh, Gord Bamford's band played keyboards on it. And uh, Ian Grant, who's this amazing drummer. Uh, all the Top Gun guys in Calgary went, yeah, we'd love to play it. Like and Paul did a hell of a job. So I put a band together in Toronto, a seven-piece band, which I wanted. I, I'm tired of the trio format. So we had a horn player and a keyboard player and two guitar players, and it was a phenomenal band. And the first thing we did was we learned this whole album because it's very musical. And then we threw in Sweet Thing and we threw in Under My Hat and a couple of obscure track, auto tracks. And we only played two dates. And then it just sort of just it just sort of wafted away, and then COVID hit, and then that's it. Great. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering, uh, Greg, if, is there uh, like pros and cons to, uh, you know, the, the solo album, Amuse Me, is there a difference uh, in the, the process? Which is, which is more of a challenge when you're, is it writing a solo, solo album or is it a collaborative uh, event with other band members? Which, which is, has more pros and cons? I, uh, which do you prefer? I don't think there's any difference for me. I mean, when, when my old roadies heard Amuse Me, they said, this doesn't surprise us that the song quality of the songwriting has improved as you mature. Right. Uh, but I always wrote eclectic. I mean, you know, you look at Who Cares? I mean, uh, with Sweet Thing on it, it starts out with an acoustic and harmonica song, you know? Uh, and, and then there's an acoustic guitar and a cello. And then there's Sweet Thing and Cock On. I mean, the songs are all over the map. And because of my Beatles fixation, their songs were all over the map. There, there right. were two Beatles songs that sounded the same. They, they, one day they were doing the uh, Obla Di, Obla Da, and it's got elements of Jamaican, you know, Tin Pan, Trinidadian music. For sure, yeah. And then they've got, you know, heavy metal with Helter Skelter. They were never the same band twice. I mean, that's the joy for them. Of course, they had three great songwriters. Right, so, right, which afforded them a lot of, a lot of options for different dynamics musically. Yeah. I mean, you know, basically, you know, George Harrison got his one song, but he sure made up for it when all things must pass. You know? Right. Um, so, so I was always writing eclectic anyway. And, you know, I mean, I produced the Gatto albums under a pseudonym. You know, Thomas Morley Turner was oh. a friend of mine. Because after the first album, the record company said, there's no way we're letting that guy produce a second album. He know he's <laughs> so I, by this time, I knew what I wanted to do. And I learned from my mistakes. And I went to see Tom Turner, who was a guy that Brian Pilling and I, he was, uh, went to school with his son, and he had a little Martin 0018, and he used to show us farmer chords when we were first starting. And I went to visit him, and I said, I need a name like Roy Thomas Baker. He said, how about Thomas Morley Turner? And I said, is that your whole name? He said, yeah. I said, I'm going to use that. So <laughs> I supernated Morley Turner. And then the second Gato album comes out and we get a review in Cashbox magazine. It says, Thomas Morley Turner's production sheen is comparable to the debut Boston album. Wow, Which that's a compliment. Hell of a compliment. But nobody could find this guy. So instead of my phone ringing off the hook looking for this Thomas Morley Turner guy to produce somebody's album, I continued on the Act of God album music and nobody could find him because it was me. So I had his shooting to the foot, you know, again. <laughs> the mystery man, that's a great story. You, uh, We're getting some comments here, uh, Greg, I'm just going to oh, share. Well, uh, Chris, Knowles is, Chris Knowles is saying legend. Good to see the legend. Uh, oh, Troy Gray, great to see you, Greg. Eva Smith, uh, great, super great supporter of the show, is she was relating to being picked on, and uh, she was relating to your stories back then, and, and uh, saying what a fan she is. Uh, Greg, you're absolutely delightful. You are welcome to drop by here anytime, and I, I know today. This. Pardon me. I love this. This was great. I'm glad that. This we is. I'm so glad we did this too. It was so great talking to you, and and I know you had a lot of things on the go today, and you know you you gracefully took time out of your day to make this work, and we and we really appreciate that. And I think I can speak for all of us 
you know, Greg, when I say we are just so grateful, you know, for the music and your significant contribution to the Canadian music industry and now the literary world. Wow. Um, well, I hope people tune in. Maybe you can find the, uh, the rock talk, uh, uh, Earl to share with your fans. I will absolutely do that. Cause we, we've got, we've got four in the can. Now we've got two with Eddie Kramer, two parts with Eddie Kramer. And then uh, two parts with Lawrence Gowan. Larry's my friend. I still call him Larry. I, I call him Lawrence on the show just out of respect, but he lives two blocks from me down the hill. And nice. uh, we've seen more of each other in the last two weeks than we have in the last five years. So I bet. I bet. And I, then, saw, I saw the, sorry, I saw of, the Gowan interview. It was awesome. And go ahead. Yeah. Well, then we did animation in it and stuff, and, uh, which takes all the time. I mean, those little half hour clips take 30 hours to put together. There's a lot of work that goes into it, and everybody's doing it themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're doing animation, which I don't think a lot of people are doing. So uh, I, I just yep. know Reese Brunel, who's very good at it. But we're, it's we're cutting gonna... edge. It's cutting edge. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So don't forget, everybody. Uh, the the website uh, www.shopgreggodovitz.com is scrolling at the bottom. There's a lot of cool merch there. You can find the books. Uh, you can find Greg's music. Greg, once again, thank you so much. You're you're absolutely delightful. I knew you'd be a blast, and, and you absolutely are. And we just we just can't wait to see what we come up with next. Have you got? Has anybody got a question before I go? Has anybody asked a question? There is a lot of comments. Uh, Greg Jojo says hi. Humor comes from pain. There are no questions. Okay, well, uh, we do that. We do that with mine. In fact, I'll say I got so and so coming up next week. Uh, if they can find me on Facebook, I've got. Uh, I met this guy a couple years ago in the Dominican Republic where I do charity work. And he turns out to be Prince's bass player from the new power generation. Oh, wow. So he, he actually played at the famous Prince uh, Super Bowl halftime where it was pouring rain. And Josh has become a good friend of mine. So I'm going to have him on the next show. But what I do is I say, hey, have you got a question for a guy that was the last guy to talk to Prince when he was living? You know? Great. And not let the audience do all the dirty work for me. Great, great idea. That's a good. I just learned something new from you today, Greg. You <laughs> and job. you know what? I am, I am going to absolutely make sure that that my viewers know about it because I'm going to post a link to Rock Talk, um, uh, on my page and on the on the station site as well. Uh, guys, tune in. Uh, like I said, I saw the gown. The gown interview was awesome. It was a two part series. Uh, Greg, thank you so much. And we, we just we just look forward to to everything that you have coming down and uh, continued success. Thanks. I, I got a few people I've been seeing in a couple of years out in my backyard, so I think I'm going to go hang with them for a while. Go, go have a beverage. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Appreciate uh, your support and uh, support Canadian music and small business while you're out there. And wear a mask. See you wear again. Wear a mask. Bye Thank now. you so much. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'm Kelly Barrett. What a great show. Uh, we have another great show coming up for you next week. Nick Gilder is going to be here, and I can't wait for that. So tune in next week. Uh, take care, stay safe and sane, and have an awesome day. Bye-bye.